the the talk now is about how to be a IETF champion, and uh, IETF stands for uh, Internet Engineering Task Force. So I don't really know much about that. Uh, it's okay. So just a quick introduction about Harish. Okay, let me see what's written here. Blank. So it's okay. <laughs> okay, Harish Pillay is the president of the Internet Society of Singapore chapter. No, past president. Past. Yeah. Okay, it's wrong again. Yes. <laughs> well, he was the president when he gave uh, he gave a talk uh, last year. He is also a pioneer on the internet, having gotten onto the ARPANET and UUCP networks in 1985. Okay, he's a ham operator, and he gave a talk at the uh, Geek Camp. Uh, there was a learn. Oh, he also operates a radio. His call sign is uh, 9V1HP. So that's that's what written on the paper. <laughs> so uh, let me see. So some of you or many people will know that uh, Harish Harish Pillay is a prominent member of the Singapore Linux community. So uh, okay, we got Google, we got uh, some somebody from Google here, and also. Well, uh, Harish has the same as last year, right? He strongly supports uh, this uh, Force Asia, and that is why uh, partly, partly uh, the reason why this thing is possible. So uh, maybe a round of applause for him. Yeah. Okay. So, so the other the other thing is that I got to know Harish a little bit better in two thousand fourteen and fifteen. So previously, uh, just uh, just a uh, high acquaintance, that, that, that kind of telling. And uh, 2014 and 15, first I, I learned that right, his deep belief in uh, open source and free software, which is not sure whether this talk is about, but just to let you know. So I, I, I learned uh, how deeply he, he believes in this. And uh, because of uh, the things that he did over a decade ago, uh, the uh, I mean, the, the software space in Singapore has changed a lot since the, uh, the fully proprietary days. Now, the other thing I learned last year, okay, is that I think the two of us share some beliefs, some convictions about our society, our community, uh, where, where the country is heading. Okay, and uh, so, yeah, but Harish, right, unlike me, he's a lot more vocal. He is not afraid to openly voice his opinions. Yeah? So he puts his money uh, or he puts his mouth where his belief is. And he also put, spends his time uh, contributing to society, to all these internet societies and other things. So uh, I'll, like, uh, I'll let Harish uh, speak his topic. Yeah? Thank you. Well, thank you, Kim Yong. That's uh, unexpected. <laughs> um, so, well, good morning. And um, the, there was a bit of a mix-up in the heading for this talk. Uh, it was not what was originally put in there uh, because it was a cut and paste error. And so, uh, move a little bit here. Oh, there you go. Cool. Oh, here. Hi. <laughs> so, um, so this is about IETF. Now the reason um, this is the topic for this particular session is that um, one of the things uh, I'm trying to achieve here in Singapore is to get a, a lot more awareness, first point. Second point is understanding of what it is that IETF brings to us and how we can contribute to IETF. The long story before I, I make the long story, I want to ask a very simple question. How many of you have heard what IETF is? Okay, apart from those Googlers, you're not entitled to answer the question. You guys, okay, you don't know, okay. All right, what does IETF actually do? Okay, so now all the hands went down. That's fine. <laughs> Sorry? It's like standards. Is IETF? Um, do you do you use anything that the IETF has ever done? One of these. The, That's a phone. No, but the, some of the technologies it uses to actually work. So with the transmission and communication. 
IETF to help define those standards. Okay. Anybody else? Other than on the phones? The internet? Yeah. The internet. If IETF didn't do or continue to do what they're doing, we don't have the internet. Plain and simple. Let's close shop and walk off. Right? So IETF is a volunteer driven organization. It is not like the traditional uh, international, international Standards Organization, ISO, ITU, all those in transnational bodies. It's got nothing to do in shape or form like them. Those are constituted based on country affiliations and blah, blah, blah. IETF is entirely grassroots driven. It's a geek driven organization. You have to understand what is going on in IETF or in the technology of your interest to make it happen for others to consume and, and, and benefit from. So one of the reasons I'm doing this talk is um, Singapore is most likely to host, okay, IETF has meetings that are held face-to-face -face every uh, three to six months and is, they rotate around the world and each of these meetings, the face-to-face -face meetings, have about 1,000, 2,000 people show up, okay? Um, and every meeting has a number to it. So meeting um, IETF 1, 2, 3, and so on. Um, for IETF 100, the schedule is for it to be held in Asia in November next year, in 2017. I'm hoping to have IETF 100 in Singapore. But in order to make that happen, I need to build a group of contributors to IETF, whatever it is that you can possibly do, so that we have a base of contributors here, at least in Singapore, <coughs> if not in the region. Because uh, contributing to IETF is, is as simple as writing a, a proposal and trying you know, get people to uh, adopt it and critique it and improve upon it, and then eventually it becomes an RFC. Okay, it's as simple as that. But the, the process can take some time because you need to win people's confidence that this makes sense and so on. So what I'd like to do in this talk, in this session here, this is not my, my material, this is from the Internet Society. Um, so the Internet Society is a global organization. How many of you are members of, a, of an Internet Society chapter? No? Okay, so in your city, most likely, there is a chapter for the Internet Society. The Internet Society is a global organization. It's headquartered, where is it headquartered? It's in Virginia or? Yeah. Reston, 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 Virginia, yeah. Geneva. And Geneva, yeah, okay. That's an expensive city. No, keep it, an eye on ITU. Okay, I know. <laughs> keep an eye on ITU, that's a good one. <laughs> because ITU wants to take over the managing the internet. You know what will happen when, you, when that happens, right? So, <laughs> um, <clears throat> having said that, um, the IETF is a body that is funded via ISOC, Internet Society. Internet Society gives funding to IETF to do the activities that IETF needs to do. So it is a very, um, uh, it's a global organization to help ensure that all the things that we need to have in the, to make the internet work is crafted, is drafted, it is debated, it is implemented, and is retired and new ones come on board. So the entire process, and anybody can participate in creating a potential standard for the internet. You don't have to be a member of a, or an employee of a company, or, or an academic. If you are just a person who has got an interesting idea, you want to make that into a standard, write it up, publish it, get it critiqued, present it, and if enough people say this is a good idea, it gets adopted as an internet standard, and your name will be there. This is very, very much like how open source contribution happens. Okay, so let me just start through, uh, walk through this a little bit. So what I'm trying to build is a group of people who could potentially be IETF contributors here in Singapore and in this region, so that when IETF 100 is finally announced to be held in Singapore, we will have people in this part of the world who are going to be able to participate in a, in a meaningful fashion. 
All right, so what is the IETF? It's the Internet's premier technical standards body. It is again not membership driven. Um, how many of you have heard of International Standards Organization, ISO? Right, ISO. ISO is a national, uh, it's, it's a country based entity. It, it, uh, it is affiliated to the United Nations because it's a global organization. But if you want to participate in any ISO related activities for standards making, you have to. You cannot be a member of ISO. I, my, I, Harish Pillay, cannot be a member of ISO. It's not going to work. They don't have that model. You have to be a member of the national body in the country, whichever country you're from. So in every country has a standards organization who will then be the representative of the country into ISO. So you have to work through the country and so on. So when you want to work through the country, you will have other issues there. Uh, and so it's a, it's a, I personally think it's a messy, messy way of doing it. I, I say it because I got in, I am involved with that and I don't like it. It's very messy I, and I don't quite like it. So it is a, a standards body like ISO, except anybody can participate. And every single standard that is created by IETF, it's available as a plain text file, freely downloadable. You compare and contrast that with any of the ISO standards, for example, you have to pay a few hundred uh, Swiss francs for, to download a PDF or get a dead tree version of it, which I think is a bit unfortunate. But that's how they have always done. They are about, I think, almost a 100 year old organization. So they need to come to the 21st century. So hopefully they will arrive soon before the century goes out, right? Uh, we still got how many more years before the end of this century? Uh, another 75, no, 85 years. I think hopefully they'll, they'll get the message. <laughs> I don't know. So the IETF gathers a large community of network designers, operators, vendors, researchers. So you can see it is not only techies in this equation. It's anybody who wants to contribute all kinds of stuff. As long as somebody wants to accept it and make it into an IETF RFC, by all means, please. Look at what's available, read it, try and improve it, and try contributing to it. So the mission of the ITF, I, you can read this as well as I can, but I want to highlight a couple of, no, I'll, I'll read this because I want to highlight some points here. The mission of the Internet Engineering Task Force is to make the internet work better by producing high quality, relevant te technical documents. Okay, it's high quality and relevant. It's, we don't really care about certain things that you know it's not really globally useful perhaps um, so it may not get approved uh, that influence the way people design use and manage the internet it's a very broad mission statement but it is an important mission statement because can you now just you know for a moment think what you would be able to do or not do if we switched off the wi-fi and disconnected the internet Can you just think of what you could possibly be doing now? Isn't it hard? It is actually very, very difficult because honestly, can you remember the last time you did not use the internet? Maybe when you were sleeping. <laughs> Even then, you may be dreaming and <laughs> you may be dreaming packets, right? I mean, just think about it. It is such a fundamental thing for us, our daily existence that without the internet, you feel totally lost, completely lost. It's very hard, but that's the reality. So if we don't look after the internet, the internet is for us to champion and look after. We cannot leave it to regulators to do these things, because they will have their own agenda. So the IETF ensures that the internet is, uh, and the internet society, that, that the internet itself is kept free and open. So no you know, unnecessary blockages uh, and so on and so forth that are placed onto the internet itself. So that's a very important thing, to design, use and manage the internet for anybody and everybody to use. <clears throat> so some of the accomplishments of the IETF, okay? Uh, domain name system, DNS. Have you ever used the DNS before? What did you use? When was the last time you used the DNS? 
web there you go. The last time you type a web address on the browser, bang, you use the you use the DNS. But did you know that you used it? For those of you who don't know, don't realize that it is as fundamental, as simple as that. It is there. It's just done. But you did get the answer back. Did you know how when you type sciencecenter.science.edu.sg that in order to retrieve the information for the website, what had to go through? What kind of uh, layers of software and different kind of uh, resolution of information had to be done before I can show, you can receive that page. So these are all, almost every level in that entire sequence of events is defined by something IETF has done. But of course, there are related organizations as well, like W3C for web standards and so on. But IETF tends to be focusing a lot more on the, uh, the infrastructure layers of the internet. It's very, very good. <coughs> so let me ask a question here as far as uh, the internet is concerned. When was the first time you had used the internet? Can you remember? Besides right now. Besides right now, yeah. <laughs> 1997. 1997. 93. 93. So did you have a dial-up modem? Yeah. Dial-up modem? Yes. Can, you, can you whistle the sound of the 56K? 14.4K, <laughs> remember that, right? I see some younger faces here. I'm sure you don't remember that. <laughs> All right. Uh, so 1993, anybody before that? Yeah, well, yeah. We, we go back a few years, yeah. Anybody else? 1992. Okay, there wasn't. I, I don't think the internet was widely available in that sense, even in Singapore. Um, I don't think it was available then. Um, anything before that is going to be a, a challenge. Uh, I, I, I totally agree with that. How many? Okay, maybe before that, did you ever use things like bulletin board systems, BBSs? Ah, now you see a lot more hands. FidoNet. Anybody on FidoNet? No. I had a FireDonet node running somewhere. <laughs> Anybody have worked on uh, the amateur radio network, AX.25, which did TCP IP? Yeah, so there is, there is a TCP IP network for amateur radio. So you plug in your radio equipment, and from your computer, you go out over the airways. You don't touch the ISP at all. And it's, it's amazing. There is no in between, nobody, no guy in between, which is fantastic, right? But you may not be able to go very far, but that's okay. At least you can go somewhere, right? So the, the internet is something that, you know, a lot of us now take for granted. In 1993, there was a gentleman in front here, and myself and maybe Kat, we, we went back many, many more years. Uh, my first experience, as you, was, uh, as you heard earlier, was when I was in grad school in Oregon State University, uh, connected to ARPANET. Okay, and I, and I had no idea what that was. And uh, all I know is from electrical engineering, we had the link and, uh, and computer science in, in the, on campus. I think we're the only two departments that had anything to do with this thing called networking. Uh, the rest, I have no idea what they were doing. And all I know is the computer science machine, the server there, that was uh, from, I think it was a digital equipment corporation machine or something. No, it was a VAX, VAX something, so VAX 11 or something. And uh, it was connected by a dial-up modem to uh, Hewlett Packard's uh, data. Uh, um, they, they had a center, it's called HPPCD. It's a personal computer division and over dial-up, which was in the same city. And HP then went out on their own to wherever it is. So there was a long path for mail, email to come to anybody in Oregon State or uh, to me. So if it, it's called the UUCP path. Anybody have used UUCP here? No other, both of us. <laughs> so Unix to Unix copy program, that's what UUC st UUCP stands for. It's a store and forward, store and forward, store and forward. And it worked remarkably well. It still works well today. It's just that very few of us are using it. I have, uh, not on this one, my systems at home, enable UUCP in the event the internet goes down. So I have my backup plan. So you have no idea what I'm talking about, that's okay. But UUCP again is something, I don't think IETF ever standardized on that, but um, you know, it's something that is there that is, is workable today. All right, so DNS, <clears throat> let me just move on a little bit. 
Uh, what else we want to do? Uh, talk about okay. All these other t standards, Web RTC. Okay, uh, Opus is a encoding standard for audio, and it's a high quality encoding standard. Again, these are not necessarily at the lower levels of the uh, infrastructure uh, track. It is you know at some aspects of the uh, of the uh, uh, solution that you are looking for as well. Um, <clears throat> So how do you participate with IETF? There's no membership, okay? There is no voting of, oh, this is an organization, therefore they got 10 votes. This is a small organization, you got one vote. You're an individual, you got half a vote. You know, no, everybody is equal, all right? Uh, IETF is entirely made, by, made up by volunteers. Yes, there is a secretariat, full-time secretariat, paid secretariat to run the thing, but otherwise everybody is a volunteer, okay? Um, the actual standards work takes place on mailing lists. Okay, um, attendance of the face-to-face -face meetings is to resolve big issues. So when you meet up, when they meet up three to six months, it's not to start the discussion then. It's to say, you know what, we couldn't resolve this on email. So let's meet one one on one or in a meeting and try and take care of whatever issues there may be. Because sometimes it's, you know, it's, it's just natural. It cannot resolve everything on a uh, mailing list or a discussion on the mailing list. So it's better sometimes to have a face-to-face -face and then we resolve whatever issue it is. There will always be issues. So don't be surprised because we're dealing with human beings here. There will be all kinds of issues. So, uh, but that's where part of the fun is. Now that's the problem area that one of the things that I'm trying to address because there will be a, a degree of discomfort of uh, individuals in participating in these face-to-face -face meetings. Because they will say, you know, you know, some people are more vocal and then you also have an issue with language. So they may not be as, and it's run, it's run in English, okay? So because these meetings are held in English, someone who is not sufficiently confident expressing their ideas in English may not even open their mouth to say anything. And so we have a problem there. And IETF understands that. And they're trying to figure out how can we make it such that people can participate in whichever way that makes you comfortable. So that's something that IETF is trying to do. So anyway, the meeting is where these things happen. And you know, one of the things of any conference, even for Asia, uh, the most of the learnings that happen, as far as I'm concerned, is what we call the hallway track. You know what's a hallway track? There's going between different uh, speeches or talks. You walk on the side, get out, go on the hallway, and then you meet somebody else and some, you learn something new there. There's a lot of unplanned opportunities to learn in the hallway tracks. That's exactly what happens in ITF as well. The amount of opportunities to, oh, so you are so and so that said this on that mailing list. Thank you very much. I like that. By just having that face to face human interaction, changes the dynamics completely because now i know who you are and you are a real person and you're not just an email address and that's a big big difference okay um so the 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 way the work is actually done in ietf is um there is a a, a group of people called edi uh, editors um and there are uh, many working groups there are about 129 ish because working groups come and go so the last time this was updated, it was 129, plus or minus one or two. Uh, there are area directors. That means these are different areas of interest from a standards point of view. And all of the individuals in these different groups, they're all volunteers. Every single one of them. Uh, the IETF chair is, uh, I think he's a paid position. I, I forget, is GE? Uh, I'm not sure what it is. I, I, I think he must be a paid position. I, I don't know. They're, but he's elected by the IETF members. Okay. Um, okay, let me just move a little on uh, working groups. So the working groups is where the limit of how things need to be done is actually done. You propose ideas. One of the things I like about IETF and how the internet standards work is as follows. I may have a good idea, okay? So I have a good idea. Now it is up to me to write it down, explain what it is, 
and put it out onto the mailing list, get people to respond to it. But what is critical is I have to be keeping an open mind about it and making sure that I accept patches or improvements or suggestions or whatever it is and be able to defend the, the idea and the suggestion. First step. Second step, it is important where there are things that need to be implemented that there are two independent implementations of my suggestion. That means two groups of people implement whatever it is that I'm proposing. And if they both can do it without me helping them build it, that means whatever has been documented is clear enough, there is you know, no ambiguity, it is implementable, and therefore it is high, more likely to become an internet standard. So it's a very simple process. So if you read any of the RFCs, if you, if you go to rfc.org, uh, I think it's rfc.org, um, you will find all the various IFC, uh, uh, RFCs that have been created since the beginning of IETF. Okay, so you, have you heard of something called RFC 822? Yes, no, yes? Oh, I've heard it. But it's don't know what it is. That number keeps coming from my brain. There you go, it's stuck in your brain. 822, what is 822? Did you ever receive email? There you go, that's what it is. It's the SMTP. It's RFC A22. Okay, what else? Um, <laughs> there are a few more. I, uh, I just slipped some numbers there. Right? Uh, um, have you used IMAP for your email? Yeah. IMAP, I forget which RFC that is. Um, do you know there is an RFC? Uh, for example, TCP IP. For TCP, there is an RFC. You know? There is a RFC for something called the Avian TCP. A-V-I-A-N TCP. So what is Avian? Anybody know? We are in the Science Center. Avian? It's something about birds, yeah. It's a bird-based TCP. Yes, this is about putting a, your packet, roll it in a piece of paper, stick it on the leg of the pigeon and let the pigeon go and the receiver receives the pigeon, takes the little packet out and starts assembling the TCP packets. And then the bird comes back. It will take, you know, 10 years for one message to go through, but hey, it's possible. It's been defined. So avian TCP, why not? Of course, that particular TCP, uh, I, I think somebody has actually implemented it. Uh, ac actual implementation somewhere so I think somebody in, in Scotland or somewhere Norway. in Norway yeah somewhere in northern Europe yeah someone implemented it got a bunch of pigeons who send packets up and down so follow the protocol <laughs> it's defined you can actually make it work it'll be very very slow the throughput is is rubbish but <laughs> it works okay you can't have too heavy a payload because otherwise the bird cannot take off right you cannot tie too much to the legs so <laughs> It's actually quite fun. I mean, when you read some of the TCP, uh, some of the RFCs, it's actually quite hilarious. Uh, they got all kinds of stuff. Okay. Um, <clears throat> let's see what else in here. Uh, some of the areas, IETF areas, um, security. If you are interested in anything around security, that's one security area. Application real time stuff, uh, operations and management. How do you manage the internet for that matter? Uh, transport services, uh, routing. Routing is a very important thing. How do I route packet packets through? Is there, are there better ways to do routing? Uh, Web RTC is a very critical uh, new technology, right? So you can go direct uh, system to system without going through an intermediary. Um, and, and things like IPv6. How many of you are, uh, have IPv6 enabled? The rest of you? Do you know what IPv6 is? Do you care? All you want to know it works, right? But it's important that this are, these are things that you know you, you do have a sense of and how do you can how you can actually uh, help improve. Okay. There is also a very interesting. I forget this one. This would be good to look up. Um, to do TCP communication between planets, it takes uh, five hours. Five hours 
for signal from the spacecraft that has gone past Pluto for their signal for its signal to reach us. Five hours. Traveling at the speed of light. So if I'm going to send a TCP packet to somebody on Pluto, how would I do that? So I say H and it takes five hours for the H to reach there and then echo back to see that it reached there. So 10 hours later, I know, yes, you receive H. Then I send E. 10 hours later, I know you have received E. So I send hello world. It's going to take a few days before hello world reaches the other side. So we have a problem. So Vint Cerf, who's uh, uh, anointed as the father of the internet, has actually come up with a protocol to allow you to do planetary-wide, interplanetary internet. Think about it, okay? It's not easy. It's not inst instantaneous. You cannot do instant messaging between here and Mars. It's not going to work. It, Mars takes, what, 45 minutes, if I'm not wrong, for speed of light to reach Mars from here. So if you want to send a packet or something to Mars, it's going to be a very, very long time. It's not going to work, okay? Or it's not going to work in real time. Forget about real time. But we need to find clever ways to get around it. Okay. Um, so some of the big uh, trends for that are of importance to ITF. Okay. Uh, the evolution of the web technology, because almost everything has been driven by the web. Security and privacy. Now this is now core central to the internet. We all need to know about privacy and security. The one of the best design decisions that the internet was built upon was the internet itself is dumb. The intelligence is at the endpoints. So that you make your, intel your, your, your pipes as simple and straightforward as possible without too many quirks. And if you want to do encryption, security, you implement at the endpoints. And this is just a pipe that brings it through. So the best way to think about this is the highway systems that we are familiar with, the roads that we are on. I don't care what is at the end of, two, uh, of, of a particular highway. One could be the airport, the other one could be a seaport. But I need to transfer a container that arrived by sea at the port, load it onto a truck, send it on the road, get to the airport, load it into the plane, and the plane takes off. Does the road need to know what went on it? As long as it can move along, don't stop, don't break the road, carry on. I don't care what your payload is. That's what I mean by keeping the, in the internet itself stupid. Let the intelligence be at the endpoints. Let the endpoints decide what you want to do. So that's really what we need to also look at it from an IETF point of view. What do we need to do to make sure that the internet is not broken? Okay. And also the role of open source development. Open source drives the internet. If it is not for the open source world, we will not have or oh, free software for that in, in those days. We will not have the internet the way we have today. Uh, have, you, have you heard of something called the um, X500? X.500? Anybody implemented that? Very complicated. Is it still being used? It is? One person. Two persons using it. No, X.500 was a one of what the, the 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 way it is made fun of is by using the phrase it was committee designed. It was designed by committee. They got no stake in the game. They designed by committee, it's done by at ITU to design X.500 which got so many layers of all kinds of stuff to, to make sure everybody is kept happy. Uh, every national body who wants to do their little bit of here and the other guys a little bit here and everything goes into this X.500. It got so complicated, nobody actually uses it. And thank goodness they spent time doing that. Because in the meantime, IETF went ahead and created and helped create the internet. If we were going to wait for ITU to make the internet happen for us, he will still be talking about it. Okay, it was not going to happen. That's unfortunately the reality. Okay, uh, 
and they, they do recognize it and they're trying to you know speed up the process and get it you know short uh, uh, and they work with IETF and see how is it that IETF can do what we have done okay so that's that's fasc uh, fascinating and open source is the core driving philosophy behind it um, let's see what I want to talk about here things like uh, you know new protocols now HTTP 2 now that's the next new protocol that we need to make sure everybody starts using um, um, the, the evolution of the technology is so fast that if we don't document it fast enough and that's one of the biggest benefit of IETF your standards bodies like ISO and all of these guys they take few years before a proposed standard becomes an official standard in IETF it can take six months it can be shorter it depends on what needs to be done it can also take forever so there's no there's no SLA for it there's no service level agreement to say no you must finish it by certain no there's because if it is not ready if people cannot understand what it is and the technology is not quite there yet what are you going to do yeah put it up and see what happens and maybe a few years later it might make sense okay um, let me just see yeah security and privacy uh, since the Snowden revelations there was a lot of stuff that we need to look at from a security point of view again is end to end you have the work done at the endpoints the internet itself is open uh, is, is completely uh, dumb um, there are a lot of other topics uh, that are coming up and um, I would encourage you if nothing else that you do at least sign up to some of the mailing lists and see what's going on see look at a conversation look at the historical stuff there's always some kind of a summary that is sent out on a weekly basis in this whatever area that you're interested in there are many, like I uh, noted area there are many areas if you're interested in security please sign up to those mailing lists and see what's going on and contribute okay um, <clears throat> let's see what I want to do yeah so how does this work get done uh, there is a flow of stuff I'm not going to cover that um, so how does IETF come this is uh, one of the fun parts right how does IETF agree on some proposal how in others how does ITF vote at a meeting I like this one here uh, okay first one it does not re require unanimity now it's not everybody needs to agree second one there is no formal voting in other words you don't start saying I, I agree you know so there are 10 persons agreeing to this and two persons against no the way it is done is that smaller bullet point it says show of hands or hum but no count hmm yeah hum so let's let's practice humming hmm one more time hmm so the louder the hum the more agreement there is the less louder it is the less agreement there is it's it's you should you should watch some of the because this it's all stream live anyway so the meetings are stream stream live so you should watch them oh there's a voting going on you can hear there's a humming going on there's humming which is actually fascinating when you think about it right forget about raising your hands and starting to count and forget that just listen to what i want to feel <laughs> hum <laughs> so that's you know when, when i first came across that and i actually saw it happening it's like man <laughs> I, I just love this. This is actually fascinating. I mean, it solves so many problems straight away. I don't have to actually lift up my hand. I can, I could be snoring for all I care, but you know. <laughs> all right. And then the disputes are resolved by discussion and final decisions must be verified on a mailing list. So just because we agreed very loud hum doesn't mean it is clear yet. It has to then be put on a mailing list and everybody says, yes, that's how it is. Okay. So is there a record? Is there? Is there a vertical process so somebody can say no? Oh yeah, you can. Of course you can. Sure you can. So that will it block the consensus? It could. It could block. If you like, oh, so, uh, uh, like whistle, oh, so, so. <laughs> I mean, it, it could. I mean, it, they, they have resolution pr uh, processes for all that. If somebody really uh, presence at a IETF meeting or, or absence doesn't matter. You can always show up later on. So when you show up later on it behooves you to go and find out what happened don't just show up without checking the archives you know at least you know read the stuff and see what happened right so what i'm going to do is um i will um, 
I will pause here for a minute because what I want to do is I want to know how many of you would be interested in participating in an IETF event? Which, if you are in Singapore, we are planning for this to be in November next year. This will be IETF 100. Now, in order to do that, I mean, it can be from any other country as well. I, I'm not saying no, it's just that you're not physically here. So a little bit tricky. But having said that, uh, what I want to do is to build up a small group of people who actually will contribute to something within IETF, one of the RFCs. So what would be necessary that needs to be done? First, look at some of the RFCs of your area of interest. Do you think there is some room for improvement maybe? Maybe not. Or something new you want to contribute? Or you want to clarify something? It's, it's your choice. There's so many ways you can do this. So what our Internet Society Singapore chapter is going to do is we're going to be having a meeting on the 4th of April to get the initial group of potential IETF contributors, interested people, no commitment, but interested people, we can meet up and figure out what it is that we can actually do. And uh, I'm hoping to get a small group going. We will have mentors from IETF to help guide you along in writing a draft and then getting it critiqued by everybody else so that it's less intimidating. Because when you put it on the mailing list, sometimes you can, if you don't have you know, sufficiently thick skin, you can be bruised very easily. So uh, I have been bruised on the internet for, you know, from, from, for a long time, so I, I, have, I have no issue there. Um, but you know, people who are going to contribute, I think you know, we want to make it a little bit easier. We don't make it too easy. You should still feel the pain. But <laughs> I think at the end of the day, it is, there's a lot of fun in doing this. That you, you learn something along the way, how you interact, creating something new, and actually getting it published. You know, that goes into your resume. Okay? And this is public. It's everywhere. Yes? But RFCs for IETF need to be about protocols, which actually need to move the internet forward, yep. make it more stable and more useful. Yep. So, you're not saying people should just come up with random stuff. Oh, no, of course not. Okay. Of course not. I mean, the intention here is to get uh, a process going. How would you write a, 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 pro, a, a draft? How do you present the draft? Um, let's, you know, how, how should you phrase it? What is the best way to write it? Are you clear enough? I mean, all those things that, you know, uh, um, your typical engineering geek may not necessarily do well enough, right? I, I'm an engineering geek, but I, I try to not go down that path of not writing well. So um, it is important that we need enough people to know because people sometimes are not necessarily uh, aware that what you need to do is maybe just a little bit more polished to what you are proposing will be more than sufficient to become uh, a proposed standard. So it's just crossing that small barriers sometimes uh, or sometimes it's just uh, they, they may be so you know in that technology that they can't extricate themselves to figure out how do I explain this to your grandmother so you know right so so that's really what this process I'm trying to initiate is trying to get enough people to say okay how do I craft this how do I draft this what do I need to do and then present it and then let's critique it it's not against you as an individual. It's how do you then bring your ideas forward? Okay, that's that's the intention behind it. Uh, you know, in a very friendly manner. It's not a uh, so don't, no blood will, will be spilled for that. Okay, you may have a ton of uh, beer uh, spilled, but then that's a different story. <laughs> okay, so <clears throat> so I can t I'll share with you. Um, I don't know whether okay. Currently, there are seven thousand RFCs already. Okay. So, um, let's see, there are some, some of these RFCs have become stand, uh, best standard practices, okay, or, or, sorry, best current practices, so current practice may change uh, as technology evolves. Um, uh, so, what, when you propose something, it is called a proposed standard, and then when it is finally approved, it becomes an internet standard. So, it's a two-stage process. Okay. Um, so you notice here, this uh, the the last word uh, word say may not be visible all the way to the back. Is interoperability not conformance? 
it is about interoperability. So remember I said, when I propose an RFC, I, we need to have two independent implementations of it. Independent, they don't know, I mean, they're not collaborating in the implementation. And if let's say it is uh, RFC A22, uh, SMTP, I implement one SMTP server, the other team also implements their own. Can I send emails between these two? Will they, are they interoperable? So it's about interoperable, not so much conformance. Okay? Interoperability is what the internet is built on. Conformance is really up to you how you're conforming to it. But at the end of the day, the, the, the interface that I see, can I interoperate? The back end is up to you. That's your implementation detail. Okay? Um, so I'll, I'll share with you a story that I had, I think I'll end here. Um, this was 1996. So 1996 was, uh, again, dial-up modems. Okay? There was no broadband, no Wi-Fi yet in any sense. So one of the challenges, I was with a, 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 a company in Singapore where we were the uh, holding company for Pacific Internet, which now doesn't exist. Uh, it was the second ISP here. So <clears throat> one of the challenges we faced was people started sending email with attachments. What a pain. Because these attachments are megabytes. Huge. Okay? So when you are traveling, which was what you know, people started doing and connecting to the internet. From where? From your hotel rooms. And you connect, you check your mail, and voila, you got a two meg mail to be downloaded. On that 14.4K. And you may be paying long distance charges, I have no idea, okay? Maybe you got local charges, maybe you got international charges, whatever. That's not a very clever way to send email. But the thing is this, it was never built with the intention that somebody is going to dial up from a hotel somewhere and also that somebody is going to put in a very large uh, 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 attachment. So w the proposal that I had, was, so myself and another colleague of mine, uh, you can look this up, it's called it's POP3, the post office protocol, POP3. The expectation was this, I want to know that when I connect to the POP3 server, I say, yes, I am so-and-so, can I have my mail, please? Then the email server will reply to me and saying, okay, you have 20 pieces of mail, and these are the various sizes of each of the mail uh, uh, packets, okay? You know, 1K here, 50K there, whatever. Then the next thing is, it will tell me that it can handle compression. So because the email that is being sent is not compressed, there is no compression that is happening. So if it is a plain text file, it's sent as plain text file. Why can't I just compress the thing? We know how to do compression. But in the protocol, it is not defined. Um, so that was what we wanted to do. So I wanted to have the POP3 servers to have this one functionality saying, yes, you can do compression. And me as the client, uh, email client, says, yes, I can accept compression. So the server will compress the file and ship it across. So instead of taking half an hour to download that one mail, maybe it takes me five minutes. I don't know, okay? So a very simple idea, but uh, it got shot down. <laughs> IETF uh, didn't make quite sense, uh, whatever, because they say we should be moving to IMAP instead of POP3. Those were the early days when the passwords were sent in the clear to check your mail. So there was no encryption from email as well as uh, the password. So so that was 1996-1997. So it was kind of, was kind of fun uh, exercise to go through and then found out that you know, the interest level was not there. And on top of that, the internet speeds were going up. So the concern that I'm going to download a very large file was beginning to become not a big issue. It's still a big issue to me because I don't want to download you know, dozens and dozens of... Especially when someone replies to all and sends the package, uh, uh, the uh, attachments back again. Ah, I'm sure all of you have had that before, right? When someone replies all with the attachments. So that was my experience. I have not since uh, proposed any new uh, standards and all because I really had no uh, uh, you know, need to do in, in, into that space. But I think it is useful for the next generation of potential contributors to get on board and see what we can do. Okay? So 
It's April the 4th. Uh, there's a sign up sheet here. Uh, so please come forward, put your name here, and we'll meet up and figure out. Now, if you like to participate but you're not going to be in Singapore, that's okay. Put your name itself and we'll try and see how we can collaborate, maybe remotely or whatever. Whatever that makes sense. Okay? So, any questions, comments, prickbacks, or bouquets, or rotten tomatoes, <laughs> avian TCP? <laughs> So look out for something that always happens on April 1st. April 1st will always, there will, usually there is some, there will be some RFC that comes out. It's, yeah, it's always quite fun, you know, that's always, always quite fun. Uh, and, and as a, a side note to that is, uh, I did something like that in, uh, in Singapore, because we have an IT standards committee in Singapore. And I think about three, four years ago, we created a, I, we, we put out on April 1st, a, a standard for Singapore. Uh, I don't know, especially those of you who are not from Singapore, uh, if you haven't gone to uh, a food court during lunch hour on weekdays, yeah, you would find that, you know, if you uh, see oh, there, there are four seats there and you've got four of you, I want to make a reservation of the seat so that I can go get whatever I'm, I, I need for, for my meal and then come back and I, the seat is not going to disappear. So we have in we it's a local term. It's called chop, C H O P E. Okay, chop means I I'm reserving it. Okay, it's a Malay word. Uh, I think it's the origin is from Sanskrit or something. Uh, oh, okay, there you go. Yeah, he just he just choked this seat. Yeah. So how does this work? It works on the basis of usually putting a packet of uh, a, a tissue paper, facial tissues, on the spot where you want to reserve or choke so so i wrote up a choke protocol <laughs> so if you look it up you will find a choke protocol available um, so it's called a choke protocol i forget if i i had to make it look very serious <laughs> so I, I i think i call it uh chrap or something like that i didn't want to call it crap but i had to call it something else uh, so the intention was to explain when you are going to a food court how would you go about making a reservation? So it was a reservation protocol for food ordering or seat reservation protocol, something like that. So the choke protocol, so they came out on 1st of April. So, uh, and there's a lot of people who actually <laughs> looked at it and said, well, that's a good idea. Now we have an official standard on how you're going to do it. Because I wanted to have the exit clause as well. So what if I see that there and I don't see anybody anywhere, what am I supposed to do? Can I dislodge that and take over the seat? Or am I obligated to honor that reservation? So how long am I obligated to honor the reservation? Five minutes? Can I just wait here? Because I got my food here, I need to sit somewhere. So, so it was, it's all in good jest, but I think it does uh, you know, uh, show that you know, there are many things that we all do. Sometimes it may look trivial, but it's actually something that you know, we can pot potentially be contributing to. All right, with that, thank you very much. Thank you.